Hey everyone. Um, all right, we're getting into iteration three now, um, which I know the ones who are live are just like, ah, ah, ah. Um, but I'll I'll try and make it manageable. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the spec. Then we're going to possibly talk through a couple of um, couple of key things. We'll see how we go for time with this. Um, we might need to um, talk more about this later. I oh, like I might pre-record some stuff later. We'll see how we go. Okay, <coughs> first thing is iteration three. Um, uh, we'll be showing a sample exam. We'll give you sample questions for an exam. I mean, I'll say this: I won't talk about the exam today, so I'm not going to answer any other exam questions. But um. Students always ask for a sample exam, and it's like we've been giving you a sample exam all term with tutorial and lab questions. Um, so, also, uh, I will talk about this now. Um, <coughs> iteration three is not going to be a a fun iteration. And oh, sorry, I don't want to say that. It's not going to be like a uh, relaxing iteration. I should say. Um, now, what I will point out is that most of the struggle of iteration two, again, is bringing it together, right? It, it's actually just like, for a lot of groups, it's like, how do we make the front end work? How do we get all these new routes in? Actually make messages send, you know, the, the whole the whole functioning of the application. Um, and I think that's the hardest part. Iteration three is not really like reinventing anything. It, it's, it's a lot of it's actually like you have your app and we're just going to ask you to add some more things to it, right? I mean, in a lot of ways, that's easier because you can kind of just tack them on compared to like iteration two where it's really about bringing it together. Um, and with that, um, some people will feel like there's a lot of work for iteration three. What I will, what I will remind people of though is that um, as educators, there's a responsibility we have to ensure that the course is sufficiently full of like super easy, easy, medium, hard, super hard content such that we can get like a reasonable spread of students, right? Because if we don't have a reasonable spread of students, then you can't adequately, um, like you don't want someone who like worked twice as, like you don't want someone who worked twice as hard to get an 84 and someone who worked half as hard to get an 81, right? And, and this is what happens in a lot of courses sometimes with uh, COVID and stuff. So. What happened last term was that the project marks were really, really high, right? Um, we changed some stuff and it was, co it was our first full COVID term and blah, 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 blah. So we had to be a little bit nicer to students and the average project mark was like 87 or something. Um, and the problem is if an average project mark is eight, we mark your projects pretty leniently, like honestly in the grand scheme of like what a 50% like assignment could be. So the problem is the marks were so high and then labs are nearly free marks with participation, right? Like two thirds of students get 20 out of 20 for class marks. We got put in a position where um, the exam had to be harder. And I don't like doing that. Like the exam, the exam wasn't like cruel, but the exam was like hard. Like I don't like students, like no matter how much you explain to someone like why an exam has to be hard, you always come out of the exam feeling crappy about it, right? And I don't think that's fun. So I just want to flag this. Every time you feel like you're overwhelmed from iteration two or iteration three, the more you're overwhelmed, the easier the exam's going to be. That's a relatively true statement. And that's just something to kind of keep in your mind. Because our job is not to punish you. Our job is to just make it challenging enough that we can separate you. Right. So if iteration three, you're like, oh my God, there's so much I can't get it all done. It's like, great. That means someone will get it done and most people won't. And therefore the exam doesn't have to have as many questions on it that most people can't answer. You know what I mean? So anyway, that's just some background on the whole thing. Um, just so you understand the story behind it all. Okay. Iteration three. What's changed in iteration three? Okay. High level. Section five is here and it's a whole new section. This section looks massive because I've included a bunch of deployment screenshots that we've already gone through, but it's no bigger than other sections really. Uh, well, it's a little bit bigger, but barely, barely much bigger. So section five's been added for you to read. We've also added um, 
some uh, extra functions to the interface. I don't really know where this starts. I can't remember. I think it's like here. So we have extra data types. And then we've added some extra functions to the interface too. I don't know where they start either. I think it's like, I think it's here. So we've added some extra interface functions here. Um, there's also a couple of new sections, I believe from 6.11 through to 6.13, <coughs> but that's it. A couple more data, a couple more interfaces, a couple more elaboration from section six, um, and then all of section five. Now, I'm not going to talk about section six um, because it's mostly just extensions of, of section five, uh, but I will talk about, um, we will go through section five together. Okay, so Iteration 3 builds off all the work you've completed in Iteration 2. If you haven't completed the implementations of Iteration 2, you must complete them as part of this iteration. The auto marking for Iteration 3 will test a fully completed interface. Now, when we say you must complete them, all we're really saying is we will assess them. I mean, like, there's nothing, nothing really that says you have to do everything from Iteration 2. Um, and some people might choose to, to skip one or two. But most of what's happened in Iteration 3 from a coding perspective is the addition of these routes. Now again, what's useful about a lot of these routes is you can largely triage them between your team members. The crux of it is that we have routes that allow you to send a delayed message. So when you send a message, instead of sending it right now, you can actually send it, you know, say I want this to be sent in an hour, right? Like a delayed send. We allow people to react and unreact to messages. That's not too hard. We allow people to pin and unpin messages. That's really not too hard. We allow users to upload photos, like profile photos. That's not terribly hard. Um, it's one of those things that once you get it, it's quite easy, but you know, that trips up a couple people. Um, we have <coughs> a couple of routes where we want um, you to have your backend generate some stats. Um, I got one of the tutors to write this route, so I'm not across the details of it too much, but it's things like, you know, um, produce like a, an array of all the how many um, you know what would you say like how many messages are shared an hour or something um, it's, it's a bit of a data manipulation it's not stats it's not math it's just a bit of data manipulation to see if you're comfortable with lists and dictionaries and stuff um, there's a little asynchronous stand up feature where you can start an asynchronous stand up in a channel and have people post their stand up information there and then we have um, the ability to reset a password. Now again, what I want to emphasize about all of this is these are all appendages. So if, you, if you've kind of got your iteration two together, you can literally like how many things are here essentially. It's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right, so there's seven things. So if you just say you have a group of three, um, and you decide you'll do six out of seven of these things, which would I wouldn't even bother. If you don't do one of these things, you're barely going to feel any impact on your mark, just to be really clear. So, um, And if you're not going to do one, I'd probably recommend not doing the password reset because <coughs> that's probably the weirdest one. Anyway, it doesn't really, actually, all of you will find these different, so I don't want to give any advice. But um, it's like you just do one of these a week. So it's like, okay, this week I'll do send later, next week I'll do pin. And this week you do that, next week. Like, you can triage these a bit more, um, which is a good thing about this iteration, I think, for a lot of you. Um, we'll be auto-marking it. It needs to be persistent. We're going to pile into it. We're going to coverage it. Um, the tests are going to be HTTP tests. It's, it's the same as iteration two. Um, you still have the front end to work with. Um, we still want you to use Git normally. Um, blah, blah, blah. Right? So... In the largest part, this iteration is just more routes and a, and a couple of things which we'll talk about now. I'm going to jump straight down to the marking criteria because I think this will get your head into it the quickest. So this is the marking criteria for iteration 3. 50% auto marks. Well, yeah, 50% auto marks. Sometimes tutors might have to manually check a couple of these things potentially like because we can't auto mark a couple of things like password reset. It's just not really that possible. Um, 
So 50% auto marks, 20% code quality, which is to do with your tests and style and all that kind of stuff, normal marks. 10% um, on all your Git stuff, that's all normal as well, right? So everything up until this point is pretty standard. Then there's three new sections. The first one is you get 5% if you successfully deploy your application. I did this in 10 minutes in a lecture before following instructions to the T. I didn't really do anything creative. Um, some of you will come across some weird problems, no doubt. Some of you will have a weird Python versioning problem or you, your code doesn't even work, but you still try and deploy it and then you get confused. Um, but there's a 5% for that. Pretty straightforward. 10% of your marks come from um, uh, bonus marks. And by the way, when I say 10% of your marks, I mean like you can get an extra 10% of your marks on top with bonus marks for iteration three which we'll come back to. So it's like if you have some extra things you want to do, you can just do them and we'll give you some marks for them um, depending on what you do. Um, and the other 15, the other 15 percent, and this one's probably the most interesting one, is for iteration three, we're basically asking you to um, write some requirements and design for future work. So I, I told you this a while ago. One of the things I don't love about the project is you don't get to spend a lot of time doing requirements analysis at the start and define your own path. So the way we've opted for this is that <clears throat> as part of like the SDLC is actually saying, hey, well, why don't you do it at the end? So we'll let you actually say, okay, well, what's beyond iteration three? Not, not actually have to implement anything, but just like kind of plan it. So requirements and future work is kind of outlined in this section 5.3 here. And what we're basically asking you to do is to produce a PDF. Um, you can make it in Google Docs or anything you want. OneDrive, Office, doesn't really matter. But you export it as a PDF. Um, and essentially what we want you to do is go through the process of figuring out some requirements and then designing an interface for those extra features, basically. So, um, it, it, typically it's like, I don't know, I saw a lot of groups last term, maybe make like a three to four page document or something with some diagrams. But essentially, like the way you go about it, I'll give you like the quick summary. Um, you find two or three people to interview, you write a survey for them, um, or, you, you know, you don't have to write a survey, but it's like um, you, you try and learn some things from them. You basically go to them and you say, you know what, have you ever used a communication tool? Well, here's dreams. What problems do you need solving? Emphasis on problems, not features. You're not asking people what features they want. You'll lose marks if you ask people what features they want. You need to, you need to try and learn what problems users have. Right? You can figure out the solutions for them, but what problems do they have? Really need to emphasize that. So you try and elicit the problems they have with teamwork-driven communication tools that are currently unsolved by dreams. You record it down like it says. After you understand them, you try and sit down and actually describe this more formally through use case diagrams or user stories and actually write that down in your document so that you can actually start better articulating to someone reading it, um, you know, what uh you know like to capture essentially what these needs are um validation after you've done that we want to see evidence of what these people what like you produce these user stories and use cases go back to the people that you interviewed or, or surveyed or whatever and basically say this is what we came up with does this seem right to you record their responses and include it in the document kind of thing. Just like if they're like, you know, we talked to them on this date and they said whatever. Um, you like get a comment from them and put it in the PDF. After that, all we want you to do then, last two things, is now it's time based on their problems to figure out the specific features and how it might work from a design sense. So if you're going to add some features into your Dreams app, um, they're going to need some routes, right? They're going to need some... Uh, like maybe one route, two route, three route, four route um, to actually implement it. You're not going to write the routes. You're just going to write the interface. Um, and then after that, you simply draw a state diagram 
to to best articulate how that feature works so this goes back to the state diagram lecture so like why we have this is essentially it's just like it gives us a chance to ask you um to um you know how would you put it like uh you actually practice some things we talked about that seem waffly right we actually give you a chance to do that so 15 percent of that comes from that pdf really it's not that hard a mark so some questions students have asked are can we interview other groups uh no we don't want you interviewing people that are other 1531 students the reason i asked you for their contact details as well is because if if we smell bs we will call or email these people and expect them to reply so Generally, the best approach is family or friends, or if you have neither, just posting on Facebook and asking a couple of strangers if they would like to, you know, share their email so you could ask them some questions. Um, or, you know, anything like that. Um, we're, we only said two or three people because we don't expect you to go crazy and try and reach out to like a dozen or something like that. Um, so yeah, that's where that 15% comes from. For bonus marks. The bonus marks are added onto the whole project. Not the whole course, just the whole project. So it can flow into, I guess, iteration one and iteration two. Um, I've emphasized here to give a rough indication of marks because I get the standard, standard question from students is like, what gives us full marks here? And it's like, it's very much a how long is a piece of string question. Um, how much time should we spend on extra features? A group which has spent half of their collective iteration three time on extra features would receive full marks. Yeah, so basically what we're saying is, if you finish iteration three, and that takes you say 50 hours for your team, and then you spend another 50 hours on bonus marks, that's like the, that's not like, I don't want to, don't think about it too literally. That's like a rough indication because I'm going to get asked a hundred questions about this. What I tell groups all the time though, is that bonus marks are the least efficient marks in the entire iteration. And what we mean by that is if you aren't confident, you're already getting like 95% before bonus marks, then spending time on bonus marks is possibly not the best use of your time. Do you know what I mean? Like the the uh, the effort to labor ratio of um, bonus marks is really high. Uh, and it's fine because there's like two reasons to do bonus marks. One is because you want to do some fun stuff and want to get a little bit of a reward for it. Um, and the second reason is because you've maxed out all your marks and you don't want to be told to stop and you want to keep having fun. Um, so, you know, just approach that one with caution. A lot of groups like to do it, and I think that's a great thing because it's it's fun to have fun. But just like, you know, I, I it's it's challenging when you have group groups go in and they go and do something really like small. I guess like you know, if someone sends a message and they type slash, um, you know, slash hi, and they hit enter, then like the server returns a, a giant ASCII image or something. And the tutor's like, oh yeah, we'll give you like, I don't know, 0.5 out of 10 for that, if that. And people are like, what? Like, I put in all that time. And it's like, yeah, but like, that's that's easy, you know? Um, so it, it's not something, you, you, it's not something there to be cheated, I guess. Um, just, just, I'm gonna just overemphasize that. Okay, um, again, I know this isn't in your repo yet. Oh, and here's some suggestions for, um, uh, extra features. Don't ask me how much e any of these extra features give you because it totally depends on how much time you put into it. You know, like you can do these terribly, you can do these effectively. Your tutor will essentially look at what you've done and assess the the intent, the extent to which you have committed time and resources to it effectively. So anyway, I know you don't all see this yet because it's not going to get released to your repo until Mm -hmm. I don't know, one one to two p.m. today, so yeah, one to two p.m. on Tuesday of week eight. Um, 
So I know you probably don't have a ton of specific questions because you haven't asked them, you haven't read it yet, but are there any general questions people have about Iteration 3 before we try and move on to a couple of, um, couple of other little topics? <coughs> Okay. Just wait for the lag. Just in case someone's shared something, give them another five seconds. Uh, iteration three is. It's going to feel like a reasonable amount of work in a relatively short time period that can be relatively easily divided. Um, if your group is like really screwed for iteration two, um, like as in like you, you've done less than 20% of iteration two or something, then um, I guess it would be worth reaching out well, okay. here's the thing. If if your group has like like what here's what we don't want to happen. A group has basically like F iteration two. Like they've like pretty much got no marks. Spending all of their time um, on iteration three stuff won't achieve anything because they have to still do the iteration two stuff. So just be very open with me and your tutor if you're from one of those groups that's just completely like screwed everything up. And I mean completely. I don't mean like, oh, you know, we we like, we finished most stuff, but like we probably lost. I mean like, you know, you're up up the, you, you haven't even learned how to send a message yet because in those cases we might have to mark slightly differently um, so that you just get a low mark instead of zero for some things. But anyway, just if that's, if you're up that, to be honest with you, a lot of those groups probably aren't even watching lectures, but um, if you are in that category and are watching lectures, just reach out to me. Um, okay, so there's three topics here before we chat to Teamwork Tuesday. Um, we might have to, I might, I might talk about some of these this afternoon um, during the bonus lecture and just like record them at the end and upload them. Um, so we'll see how we go with that. Um, the one that we're not going to give much help with, right? So like, please don't post on the forum saying like, I don't know how to send an email because it's like, it's actually just one of those things that we're saying is like, this is challenging. We'd like you to go and do some research for yourself is like how to send an email um, from your server. Now there's a lot of different ways you can do that. But one of the simplest ways that we'd recommend is if you create a dummy Gmail account, as in like you make a Gmail account called, you know, Friday09B at gmail.com and you put in someone's personal name and mobile number. Um, and then you make it a less secure app, which I've linked in the slides to do. Then you can actually like do something here like Google SMTP email send flask. And you'll probably get a couple of helpful articles like these ones, for instance. Um, where you just plug in some details and poke around with it and stuff. Um, and yes, make a hot, make a dummy account for the whole group to share because you'd probably actually have to put the literal email and password. Like you'd, you'd be putting the password here, um, like that. Um, there are other ways to do this, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's why I said password resets, probably the last one I do. Cause it's the one we give the least support with because it's one of those challenging ones that we want you to play with. Um, but yes, that's a that's a big hint. Honestly, that like even just me telling you that'll probably get you half the way there. Um, so that slide's just like a hint, you know. Go go push into that. Um, Naso says, will we get our mark for our iteration two before iteration three submission? Uh, yeah, you will. Um, albeit maybe not stunningly quick. Um, but I would guess the end of week nine really yeah like my week nine end of week announcement because your tutors still have to talk to you this week and then they'll have a week to mark you and then we still have to run the auto markers um so yeah we'll see how that goes okay 
So the second one here, storing and serving images. Um, yep, and then the third one is using threads and timers. Great. Let's talk about this one first because it's quick. So when do, when um, there's a whole bunch of ways that in iteration three, well, there's two ways you might be asked to do things that are what you would call asynchronous. Um, the first one is what I said about sending messages later. So you want to send a message delayed by an hour. The second one is if you would like to um, uh, do the asynchronous stand-up stuff, where which you, you'll have to read into. But the point is sometimes you want to do things that are asynchronous. And it's actually very easy to do that in Python, and I'll, and I'll show you the code for it. I don't know if it's, yeah, timer.py. So if I open timer.py, let me just open this. Yep, there it is. Now, um, <coughs> with Python, you can import the threading library. And what the threading library essentially allows you to do is for you to tell it, hey, Python, I'd like you to run this function asynchronously. Hello, three seconds from when you process this line of code. So basically, when this code runs, it will, um, these two lines here, will tell Python, after three seconds, I want you to run hello in a whole other thread. We we're not getting into multi-thread or whatever, but it's kind of like, think of it as like a, you know, like a little side project for the Python interpreter. So, you know, now when I run python3 timer.py, um, it says starting, it printed this out immediately, and then after three seconds, it says hello timer. So it goes, it goes like, it runs this, it goes bam, start the timer three seconds, and then print this, and then the program's kind of done, but the side gig is still running, and after three seconds, it prints out starting hello timer. Um, again, <coughs> you can take that further, you can take that less. Iteration 3, these are the slightly harder parts of Iteration 3. Um, so like we're just kind of giving you some hints here so that you don't have to like feel like you're doing cold research by yourself. Um, and this is the hint for the timer one. Pretty, pretty straightforward to be perfectly honest. Python's a relatively easy language to do this stuff in. So the last one to talk about, which is the hardest one, is storing and serving images. And the reason this one's kind of hard is because um, what we actually ex what we expect you to do with the profile upload. When I say hard, I mean there's like multiple steps to it. It's not that hard. Um, for iteration three, when a user goes to upload a photo, what you're actually going to do is the the user will give you a URL. I I don't know why time is imported. It's probably imported unreasonably. You're going to give them a URL. Um, they will use that URL to download an image. You will then crop that image and you will allow that image to be served through your Flask server. Now again, I know that you haven't read the spec. Normal, in previous terms, we don't normally make the iteration due like this late. Normally it's been out for a week. So like I understand that like for many of you, you'll kind of want to read the spec and then watch this again. Um, but rather than kind of give you the whole code and completely eradicate any learning you have on the topic, um, I'm instead giving you three parts to this code that you can combine yourself. And they're pretty generous parts, like as in, you know, they're pretty out of the box. Um, the first one is image down, <coughs> which is basically, um, how do you download an image, right? Um, and this file here, it uses the UR URL lib request library to essentially retrieve um, something. And, and we pass it two arguments, sysargv1 and sysargv2. Now how this URL retrieve function works, part of the URL lib request library, is it actually, um, uh, well the first argument is the URL you'd like to download and the second argument is the file you'd like to save it to, right? So if I give you those two arguments for instance, um, the URL and the file, let's try this out, right? So Python 3 image down. <coughs> when I run this, it's just going to like do nothing. But if I give it the two arguments, let's first give it an image of some sort. Let's say um, Eris is my favorite dog on the internet. Eris dog. Great. So I'm going to copy this image URL. All right, paste this here. I might put this in quotations just to keep it safe. 
And then the second one I'll give it is a, um, a file path. Now I might have these the wrong way around, but let's give it a try. I'll call this errors dot, what, what is it? It's a, uh, that's oh, probably written here, dot JPEG. Okay, so now when I type in ls, um, notice that there's an errors.jpg in my terminal now, right? It says it right there, errors.jpg, display errors.jpg, like it's there. I've downloaded the file to my system. Really easy, like literally one line. Um, URL, file path, it'll just save it for you. Done and done. Powerful. Um, Cool. <laughs> um, the second one here is cropping an image. So I've downloaded an image. I've got it stored in the system now, but how do I crop it? Well, the way you crop an image um, using Python is you use the Python image library or PIL. Um, and you can, again, you can just copy and paste this code and it's pretty simple. Um, you open an image, right? So we give it a file path, right? Which is the errors.jpg. Then we give it our crop coordinates, right? Because you can imagine cropping an image is like taking a whole image and um, essentially picking one XY coordinate and another XY coordinate, and that's the new the rectangle. Um, and then we save that image, right? So again, like you don't need to be an expert in this stuff. Like you use these abstract Python libraries, you open an image, you crop the image, you save the image, and it's going to override the file. So now what I'll do is I'll run Python 3 crop.py, and you can see that it takes in five arguments. The first one is the image itself, and then the next ones are the um, the x y coordinates. So I do x one, y one. So I'll, I'll start from like 50, 50, and I'll go to like 150, 150. So just to be clear, if I have an image like this, and I pick the spot 50 pixel, 50 pixel, that's going to be 50 from the top left, 50 from the 50 from the top, 50 from the left. And then if I do 200, 200, it's going to go like 200 from the top. 200 from the left and like what I'll be left with is the cropped image in this square here like that so I'll do 50 50 200 200 and then if I open errors.jpg it's a little cropped version of it but you can see now I can actually run these two things one after another you can also see how much code we're literally giving you um, so I'm going to download the image again and now I'm going to crop it to something slightly more generous like 700 700 50, 50 to 700, 700. Yep, okay, so that's cropped, and I could crop it again to something a bit smaller if I want to. There you go, so now we can crop an image. Now the third part here is how do we make that image available for someone, right? Like how do we make that URL, like the new image I have downloadable? And the answer to that one is um, in static.py. And <coughs> This is a very simple Flask server that you could integrate components of into your own Flask server. This is also normally the area that people struggle with the most. Um, and basically the way this works is that you set up a directory, I think. Well, first let's try and run this server. Let's do it, python3 static.py. So the way this server works, I think, is that you'll have a static folder Um, let me see if I get this right. So you'll have a static folder and then inside that you might have a whole bunch of files. So I'm going to move Eris inside the static folder. Right? <coughs> and then I'm going to run static.py. And then inside a static. like once that's running I'm going to open up my web browser and I'm going to try and navigate to um, 127.0.0.15000 slash um, static slash Eris. So the way this works is <coughs> anything on this route here um, will automatically try and pull a file from the static folder. So I could put images there, I could do anything. Inside of static I could like I could put hello.txt, hello, like that. Um, and then when I run the server, it's like as long as I do like static slash, it'll load anything from that file. Like that. So as long as you're um, as long as you're putting your files in the static folder and you're using this Flask server we provide you effectively, um, you're able to um, load up any static files. 
Are there any questions about that? That's the crash course in the in the iteration three harder content. Otherwise, we'll we'll maybe finish up with our little teamwork Tuesday. Um, <clears throat> what does path path mean? Um, basically, what this means is, is extract all the information after the static so that I can look that up in a file. It's basically like trying to capture it. Um, uh, the syntax is just going to be a Flask specific thing. Um, Len says, so if we had multiple files in static, it would open them all. Yeah, so anything in the static folder can be open now without needing to add an extra route. So. It's a very common approach in HTTP servers is to have some kind of static folder that essentially just um, serves files. I'm just going to do a poll. Quickly. Great. OK, so any other questions? All okay, right, well, I'm going to assume that's all the questions for iteration three for now. Um, so hopefully that gives a bit of an overview. And again, yeah, that'll be released later on Tuesday, week eight. <coughs> 